a week before the wedding. My fiancé spent a fortune to buy the rights to a novel, all because the novel was written by her ex-boyfriend. A tribute to their first love, when the media asked me about this, I just smiled faintly. To go full circle and reunite with your first love, that's a rare fate. I wish them happiness. That evening, when the interview aired, my fiancé, who had been emotionally distant for half a year, took the unprecedented step of contacting me. She told me to stop talking nonsense. She even threatened to cancel the wedding unless I clarified things with the media. But what she didn't know was, I didn't want to marry her anymore either. Chapter 1 When Chloe spent a fortune to buy Alex's rights, and personally invested heavily to hire the best PR team in the industry to promote him, I found his novel, The Years Like Poetry, and read it. It wasn't anything special. That was my only comment after finishing it. It's just an ordinary story about teenage first love in a school setting. There are countless novels like this, and many are better written. But just because Alex wrote about his past with Chloe, Chloe didn't mind slapping me in the face to give him all this publicity. And at that time, there was less than a week left before our wedding. I called her, but her assistant picked up. It seemed my calls had been redirected. Brother Lou. President Lou is in a meeting right now. Try calling back in two hours. The assistant's tone was cold. After all, President Lou is busy. Her schedule is full every day. It felt like she was mocking me, as if I, a washed up actor, had nothing to do. Over the past two years, this assistant, who followed Chloe around, seemed to have picked up on the growing distance in our relationship. She no longer showed me the same respect as before. I smiled. All right. After I hung up, my manager, Sandra, looked worried. The media has blocked all the exits. It seems you have to give an interview. Daniel, what did President Lou say? I hadn't even reached her. What could I say? I kept a calm expression and stood up. Let's go. Say what needs to be said. Sandra was stunned immediately understanding my intent. What? But isn't that not quite right? Why wouldn't I take advantage of this opportunity for some free exposure? As a washed-up actor, I had called Chloe to ask how I should handle the media questions aimed at me. But since she sent her assistant to deal with me, there was no need to save face for either of them. I pushed open the door and stepped out. A crowd of reporters swarmed toward me. Among the microphones thrust in my face were eager, gossip-hungry expressions. They asked, Mr. He. President Liu has recently been promoting the up-and-coming writer Alex, and witnesses saw them boarding a flight to Greece this morning. What are your thoughts? Mr. He, your wedding with President Liu is scheduled for next week. Will her vacation with another man on the eve of the wedding affect the ceremony? Ah, so Chloe wasn't in a meeting. As her assistant claimed, she was off vacationing with Alex abroad. Mr. He, some internet users claim that the recently popular novel The Years Like Poetry is actually about the relationship between the author and President Liu. Is that true? Mr. He, Countless flashes went off in front of me, capturing every change in my expression. I smiled professionally and spoke loudly and clearly, ensuring everyone could hear. Yes, everything you're speculating is true, and my thoughts. I believe that to go full circle and reunite with your first love, that's a rare fate. I wish them happiness. Chapter 2 As expected, that interview immediately made headlines in the entertainment section. The names of Chloe, Alex, and me were trending in real time. Social media exploded with speculation. Uncovering every little detail about the three of us, Alex's fans attacked me, calling me a washed-up actor, accusing me of riding his coattails and smearing their beloved author. But my fans fought back, calling Alex a homewrecker and Chloe a cheater. Spectators mostly enjoyed the drama. Some laughed at me for being a cuckold, while others claimed I was a gold digger, feeding off Chloe's wealth and deserving of this outcome. But overall, the majority of comments supported me, even though they mocked me. No one defended Alex's behavior of stealing someone else's fiancé. After all, I've been in the industry for as long as Chloe and I have been together. Alex's fanbase was no match for the public. The more they spoke, the more they were insulted. So they had to stay quiet. Some gossip outlets even dug up that Alex lived in the same neighborhood as us. This revelation only worsened the public's opinion of him. Everyone started calling for a change in the phrase, the neighbor's lover, saying it should now be, the lover from next door. When I saw this, I was slightly surprised. Alex lived in the same neighborhood. That explained a lot. Several times I had woken up late at night to find Chloe missing from bed. When I called her, she'd say she couldn't sleep and was taking a walk in the garden. Turns out her walk was taking her to Alex's place. Realizing this, I took a moment to check in with myself emotionally. Other than finding it a little amusing, I felt nothing. It seemed that I no longer cared what Chloe did. Chloe's assistant called me several times and sent multiple texts. I didn't even bother to read them. Just blocked her. It was laughable. Why didn't she do something earlier? I had given her a chance, but she didn't take it. That night, Chloe, who was still abroad, must have realized the uproar back home. Finally, she called me, 
It was the first time she had reached out to me in six months. Chapter 3. It's pretty funny when you think about it, right? There was less than a week left before our wedding. Everyone in the circle knew we had been together for ten years. But in the end, she ran off to Santorini with her first love, leaving me in this embarrassing situation. I answered the call, curious to hear how Chloe would explain this. Instead, she immediately started accusing me. Are you out of your mind? What kind of nonsense were you spouting to the media? I worked so hard to build up Alex's reputation. And now you've ruined everything. Daniel, you'd better release a statement right away. Saying that Alex is a close friend of ours and that I brought him to Santorini to help with the wedding planning. I laughed. Really? Chloe's voice on the other end was full of impatience. What's real or not? Just go with the statement and handle the PR. Oh, so it wasn't real after all. That story about Alex helping with the wedding, she just wanted an excuse to bring him along. I'm afraid I can't do that. I refused her outright. Chloe hadn't expected me to refuse. And she was silent for about half a minute before exploding with anger. What do you mean you can't? You caused this mess by talking recklessly. So you better clean it up. Do you remember where we're having our wedding? The voice on the other end went dead silent. I calmly continued. The invitations have already been sent out. And the location is clearly stated. You hired a local wedding planning team. And the venue is set in a hotel here in the country. You think the media won't figure that out? Santorini. Huh. I remembered when we were still in love. She told me that we had to have our wedding in Santorini. She wanted everyone to witness our love in front of the romantic AGNC. But when we finally got around to planning the wedding, she was distant. She kept saying she was busy, that the company had signed a high-stakes deal, and she didn't have time for a wedding abroad. A fancy hotel in the country would do, just something to get it over with. After all, we had been together for so many years, so there was no need to make a big fuss. Yet here she was, taking another man to the very place we had once dreamed of for our wedding. Chloe, furious and embarrassed, snapped. I don't care about any of that. Just clean up this mess. I don't want any negative press about Alex when we get back. Otherwise, there's no need for us to get married. And with that, she hung up. She seemed confident that by threatening to call off the wedding, she'd get what she wanted. I tossed my phone aside and went back to packing my suitcase. What a shame. Chloe, I didn't want to marry you either. Chapter 4 Chloe and I have been together for 10 years. Our relationship was always stable. Until last year when things began to change. At the time, I didn't know Alex was Chloe's first love. I just found it odd that Chloe, always so busy with work, suddenly had time to get into reading novels. She explained to me that she was looking for potential stories to buy the rights to early, before they became popular, so she could adapt them into films or TV series later. So I didn't ask any further, until half a year ago, Chloe suddenly spent millions to buy the adaptation rights to a novel under 300,000 words. She then partnered with the website hosting the novel to push the author into the spotlight as one of its top writers. There were signing events, PR teams, and all kinds of promotion. That's when I felt something was off and decided to read the novel myself. After finishing it, I couldn't help but wonder, what about this lackluster, slow-paced coming-of-age story was worth millions. So I had someone privately investigate the author. That's when I learned that, before accepting my confession, Chloe had just broken up with her first love, and that first love was none other than Alex, the author of the novel. I even found out that it was Chloe who encouraged Alex to start writing novels. She promised him that no matter what he wrote, she would promote him and make him famous. So, no matter how bad the novel was, as long as Alex wrote it, as long as it was about their teenage love, Chloe would buy it all up. But why? I'm the one who's Chloe's fiancé, her partner for 10 years. Yet for a relationship that lasted less than 2 years, she spent money on the rights and heavily promoted her first love. So what does that make me? What were the past 10 years of my life worth? I've been in the entertainment industry for so many years. I've experienced fame and failure but I never once asked Chloe to help me. Yet the fiancé I loved so much was exhausting herself, going all out to make another man famous. I felt like the biggest joke in the world. So, for the first time in our 10 years together, I got really angry at Chloe. I thought she'd feel guilty, but instead, Chloe sneered and said, Daniel, you're such an ungrateful fool. You think I've never helped you? Sure, you're too proud to ask for help but everyone in the industry knows you're my boyfriend. Just that alone has made people think twice before replacing you. You think you haven't been replaced in this fast-paced entertainment industry just by luck? It's me, Chloe, my company, United Culture, controls half the resources in this industry. You should be thankful that I'm your fiancé, keeping you somewhat relevant in this circle. Otherwise, if I didn't want you to benefit, you'd be a washed-up actor, stomped on by everyone. At that moment, seeing Chloe's sneer and her condescending tone, I realized I had never truly understood her. After our fight, Chloe didn't care about our wedding date. She started a cold war with me. 
even going so far as to block my access to resources in the industry. Back when I was at my peak, I had signed with Chloe's company, United Culture. If she wanted to suppress me, there wasn't much I could do, my work came to a halt, and I was effectively blacklisted. But luckily, during this six-month Cold War, my contract with United Culture expired. Maybe Chloe forgot, or maybe she just didn't care. Either way, she never sent me a renewal offer. During those long six months, I doubted myself, tortured myself, and finally came to a realization. Not all relationships bloom and bear fruit, and not all people are meant to walk with you to the end. The end of my contract with United Culture meant it was also time to end my relationship with Chloe. Chapter 5 As I was about to leave, Sandra, the person who brought me into the industry, came to see me off. We had climbed the ranks together, and she had become a well-known manager in the circle. She could have easily started her own company, but out of loyalty to me, she signed with the same company and, after Chloe divided up her resources, suffered the same suppression as me. In a way, she had ruined her career because of me. If there was one person I owed the most, it was Sandra. I transferred all the savings I had to Sandra, hoping to compensate her in some way, but Sandra just patted my shoulder. The path I chose, I'll own up to. The company offered me two contract renewals, and I turned them both down. She smiled. Maybe this is the universe testing me. Daniel, I've decided to start my own agency. The money you gave me, consider it an investment. I hope when you come back, you'll be the pillar of my company. I smiled and agreed. As I was about to pass through security, Sandra suddenly called out to me. Among the things you asked me to handle, there's also your wedding ring. I understood. Throw it away. It's not important. The wedding ring had been chosen by Chloe's wedding planning team. It had no sentimental value. I had let go of this 10-year relationship. So anything symbolic of it no longer mattered to me. Sandra nodded. Safe travels. I'll be waiting for you to come back. As the plane landed in another country, I snapped my old SIM card in half, keeping only Sandra's contact information. Everything, from now on, would be a fresh start. Chapter 6. I enrolled in a well-known drama school in the US. For further studies, during the five years I was signed to Chloe's company, United Culture, I went from being a top actor to gradually fading into obscurity in the entertainment industry. On one hand, Chloe was focused on her company's rapid growth, constantly signing new talent and using me to star in scripts that would help them rise to fame. She rarely cared about the quality of the scripts, as long as they could be filmed and approved, she'd push me into the spotlight. This led to me starring in a slew of poorly received dramas with low ratings. Some of my haters even spread rumors in gossip forums, claiming that I had gambling debts, which is why I was taking on these bad roles. And when good scripts or major productions came knocking, wanting to collaborate with me, Chloe would intervene, telling me to pass the opportunity to newcomers. She'd say, Dan, you're already famous. Taking on this role would just be the cherry on top for you, but it won't make or break your career. But so and so really needs this opportunity. The company is ours, and if they succeed, it's good for you too. By the time my fame had waned, and I was no longer as popular as I once was, she turned her back on me. She acted as if I owed all my success to her, that without her. I wouldn't have any recognition left in the industry. During the time I was blacklisted, I watched as my name frequently appeared on lists of the worst actors, made by netizens. I had no choice but to admit. Over the years, my passion for acting had been drained by the subpar scripts Chloe handed me. Being with her had not only worn down my career but had also made me forget why I entered the industry in the first place. I didn't want to star in a series of terrible dramas, I wanted to leave a lasting mark on Chinese cinema. Leaving Chloe also meant abandoning my career of the past 10 years. Starting from scratch, during this time, I met a junior student, an overseas Chinese named Jana. She was a rising star in the directing program. Her father, Sam, was a world-renowned director whose films had won numerous domestic and international awards. Director Jiang had retired from filmmaking at 45, shifting his focus to photography. But even though more than a decade had passed since his last award-winning film, Jana, his only daughter, naturally drew attention the moment she enrolled. I met her by chance. After all, Sam's films are considered an important part of film history worldwide. It made perfect sense that several of his classic works would be used as required material for analysis in our drama courses. Chapter 7. We started talking after fighting over a seat. Since I was older and a foreign student, I usually sat in the back corner of the classroom, but she also never sat in the front row. After a few times of finding her golden seat taken by me, she had no choice but to sit next to me. Then, she got smart and started arriving earlier than I did. When I found my seat taken, I naturally started arriving earlier too. After a few rounds of this, she finally got frustrated and let out a curse in Chinese. F asterisk asterisk K, what's your deal? This seat isn't yours. Hearing the familiar language, I perked up and responded, the seat isn't mine, 
but I got here fair and square. She rolled her eyes and said, fine, whatever. But next time, she arrived even earlier. We got to know each other through this back and forth battle over the golden seat. Once we were more familiar, I asked her why. In a class that often discussed her father's films, she never sat up front. Her whole body stiffened at that. She stayed silent for a long time. It wasn't until the class ended, and she looked at Sam's name on the screen that she quietly said, My father may always be a mountain I can never climb. Later, I learned the full story. Sam retired from directing in his prime, passing the baton to his daughter. Jana grew up under the influence of his teachings, but as she officially entered the industry, she realized just how difficult it would be to surpass her father's achievements. After all, at 26, she had yet to make any real mark. While her father had swept the awards circuit with his debut film at 23, he was hailed as a genius director. Over time, the pressure became unbearable for her, and she even developed symptoms of depression. Seeing Jana struggle, I couldn't help but relate to my own experiences. I came from a prestigious acting academy and debuted in major productions. By my third year as an actor, I was working with a renowned director. Reaching the peak of my career, I won my first award, and countless offers for roles and endorsements flooded in. I was raking in both fame and fortune, becoming a rising star known for my acting skills. But after I dissolved my studio and signed with Chloe's company, I became like a candle, slowly burning away all my passion. Because I had once stood at the top, falling into the pit felt even more painful and unfair. What Chloe didn't know was that I, too, had been on antidepressants for a long time. During those six months when she blacklisted me and gave me the silent treatment, I even self-harmed and attempted suicide. But in the end, I pulled myself out of that dark place. I decided to give up everything from my past and start anew in a different place. Chapter 8. Perhaps Jana found some inspiration in my story. She decided to take a year off from school, and I didn't stay idle during that year either. I tried out various short-term jobs. I worked as a cashier at McDonald's, as a waiter in a bar, washed dishes in restaurants, and even did manual labor at construction sites. Ever since I graduated from university, I had been in the entertainment industry. In reality, I lacked any real experience or empathy for the life of ordinary people. Looking back, this was the first year I truly saw the complexities of society, the first year I experienced how a regular person struggles to survive. Over time, I gained new insights into acting. When Jana returned to school, she came back full of new ideas. She planned to shoot a short film. She invited me to be the lead actor. Of course, I agreed without hesitation. Jana submitted the film to several short film festivals, and it received quite remarkable results. She finally made a name for herself in the film world, overcoming the immense pressure she had been under. The success of the short film helped ease some of that pressure. It also brought with it a wave of new inspiration and creativity. Jana quickly began preparing for her first feature film. She even wrote the script herself, a surreal suspense drama. Once again, Jana invited me to play the lead role in her film. In this movie, I played a transgender individual with schizophrenia, undoubtedly. This was a huge challenge for me. We filmed the movie intermittently over the course of three years. Both of us were under a lot of pressure, but the film was worth the time and effort we put into it. When it was finally released, it received widespread acclaim both inside and outside the industry. Jana truly became famous through this film. At the age of 30, she achieved what her father had, a debut film that swept numerous awards. The media hailed her as a late-blooming genius. My name also resurfaced alongside her film, reappearing before the public. That year, I turned 35. Chapter 9. Jana's film was also invited to participate in a domestic film festival. As the male lead in her film, I received an invitation too. After five years away from my homeland, I finally decided to return, unlike when I left, unnoticed and forgotten. When Jana and I landed, we were greeted with a warm welcome from the media and fans. The airport exit crowded to the point of being impassable. We were bombarded with countless questions, until one reporter suddenly asked, Mr. E, five years ago you left the country and your wedding was cancelled. Now that you're returning with a new film, do you plan to reunite with MS? Lou from United Culture. Hearing Chloe's name, I was momentarily taken aback. After all, five years had passed. Aside from Sandra, I had completely cut ties with everyone from my past. Sandra had briefly mentioned to me when I first arrived in the US that Chloe was looking for me, but I told her that after that, I didn't want to hear anything about Chloe anymore, so I had no idea how Chloe was doing now. Instinctively, I blurted out, what, she hasn't married Alex yet? I thought, given how much she had publicly promoted her first love, she must have been deeply attached to him, but judging by the reporter's tone, she still wasn't married. Perhaps my genuine confusion sparked the reporter's interest, and suddenly all the questions were directed at me. Mr. He, are you saying you haven't been in contact with MS Lou at all? 
Is it true, as rumors suggest, that your relationship with MS Lu has completely fallen apart? I couldn't help but laugh. I thought I made it clear five years ago, but if there's still any doubt, let me reiterate, I have no further relationship with Chloe. I wish her and her first love all the best. Now, let's end the personal questions here. I hope everyone can focus more on our film. Once we finally escaped the reporters and got into the car Sandra had arranged for us, Jana pulled down her mask and smiled at me. You once told me you were a popular actor back home. I didn't believe you at the time, but now I see I underestimated you. I chuckled. It's not exactly a good reputation. Being remembered for a scandalous love triangle isn't something I'm proud of. I was a bit worried that this might affect the promotion of the film back home. But to my surprise, Jana, in her usual carefree manner, said, What's the big deal? This could even bring some buzz to my film. It's a niche project. After all, although I made it with the intention of winning awards, if more people buy tickets, I'd be all for it. After saying that, she leaned in closer and whispered in my ear, Let me ask you something. Do you really have no feelings left for your ex-fiancé of 10 years? Chapter 10. I had once told Jana about my past with Chloe. At that time, she asked me, if Chloe hadn't wanted to break up with me, what would I have done? Looking back now, her question feels almost prophetic. It turns out, Chloe didn't end up with Alex after all. I understood what Jana was really asking. She wanted to know if there was any chance that Chloe and I could get back together. I thought about it and told her. I just find it all very annoying. I had assumed that after I left, Chloe and Alex would live happily ever after. But surprisingly, she remained single all these years. I had a feeling that during my time back in the country, Chloe might cause trouble for me. Sure enough, my instincts were right. Since I had signed with Sandra's new agency, the next day, when I went to the company to see Sandra, I ran into Chloe. Five years had passed. Chloe had gained quite a bit of weight. She wasn't young anymore. As soon as she put on weight, all traces of her youthful charm were gone, and her age seemed to catch up with her all at once. She looked like she could be 40, and I would have believed it. When we saw each other, we were both stunned. Chloe was the first to react, excitedly calling my name, but very quickly, for some reason, her face changed, and she hurried away. I found the whole encounter a bit baffling. When I reached Sandra's office, I could still see a trace of lingering anger on her face. I had a hunch it was related to Chloe, so I asked Sandra. As soon as she heard that I had run into Chloe, she couldn't hold back and started cursing. I've never seen someone so shameless in my life. From her words, I was able to piece together Chloe's life over the past five years. Chapter 11. After I left, Chloe searched for me for two days, but when she heard from Sandra that I had gone abroad, she suddenly became furious and told Sandra to pass on a message, if I kept up this act, she would replace me with Alex at the wedding in two days, she said I would regret it, by that time, I had already told Sandra not to tell me anything about Chloe anymore, Sandra knew how determined I was, so she didn't pass on Chloe's message, did she go through with it, did she really replace me at the wedding, I asked, Sandra let out a mocking laugh, replace you, could she even pull that off, in the end, the wedding didn't happen, when reporters asked her about it, she said you two had planned to hold the wedding in Santorini, and that the trip she took with Alex was to scout the location. She barely managed to cover it up, but who believed that crap? Chloe's company, United Culture, faced backlash because of the whole ordeal. Her efforts to promote Alex were also undermined by my comments, which gave the public something to laugh at. A youth novel with a small target audience was suddenly dug up by the gossip-hungry masses. Aside from Alex's hardcore fans, most people who read the years like poetry shared my opinion. It was a mediocre uninspired youth romance. Most people couldn't understand how it had been hyped up so much. It even ended up being voted as the most overrated youth literature on several platforms. As they say, to wear the crown, one must bear its weight. Chloe had built such an enormous platform for Alex, but his talent couldn't live up to the public's expectations. The novel was torn apart by critics. As more people read it, they noticed that many of Alex's sentences were eerily similar to those in a lesser-known web novel. So, before Alex could clear his name from the cheating scandal, he was hit with plagiarism accusations. Plagiarism in online literature is always hard to define. The original author found out about the plagiarism and, armed with evidence, filed a lawsuit against Alex. The case dragged on for years without resolution. The main reason being that the years like poetry had no real literary value to begin with. The fame and accolades Alex had received were largely manufactured. The original author demanded compensation, but Alex refused. He believed that the work he plagiarized wasn't worth much and that if it weren't for Chloe, even if he had plagiarized, the novel wouldn't have gained so much attention. This twisted logic led to years of entanglement between him and the original author. With the case frequently trending on social media, netizens demanded that Chloe and Alex apologize to the original author for the plagiarism scandal. Yet, 
In a move no one could understand, Chloe chose to ignore the backlash and instead assembled a high-profile team, boldly announcing plans to adapt the years like poetry into a film. This move caused an even bigger uproar online. The internet erupted in fury and condemnation. Chapter 12. Chloe probably wanted to take the infamous route. She stubbornly pushed through the criticism and finished filming within six months, rushing to release it as fast as possible. As expected, the movie, hastily put together, lacked any sincerity. Even though Chloe cast the most handsome young male leads and the prettiest rising actresses from her company to tell this youthful story, the audience still criticized it, accusing her of feeding them garbage. Are you serious? Not only do I have to watch the ugly children of capitalists, but they're also forcing me to witness her cringeworthy first love. Whoever watches this plagiarized garbage is a total idiot. Comments like these were everywhere. This went completely against Chloe's expectation that the more fiercely the audience criticized, the more people would watch. In the end, this high school romance film, which reportedly had a 200 million yuan investment, made less than 10 million at the box office. She lost everything. In the past, such a loss wouldn't have mattered much. But Chloe had signed a performance contract with her investors. The dismal failure of Poetic Youth meant she couldn't meet her contract's performance targets. Shares in United Media were divided up. As the CEO and majority shareholder, Chloe was completely ousted by the investors. So, what does that have to do with her coming to find you? Sandra rolled her eyes. Isn't it because your movie became famous? Chloe went around claiming you were still one of United's artists. Only after she accepted several endorsement deals for you did she realize your contract had long expired. When I found out, I immediately announced that you had already signed with my Hichuang Media. That's when Chloe came to fight with me. Sandra rubbed her temples, but Chloe couldn't produce any evidence proving you were still under her company. So although the argument blew up, public opinion sided with me. That's when I learned about this series of events. Sandra warned me. Anyway, things haven't been easy for her in recent years, so she'll probably come looking for you. Stay alert. Sandra's prediction turned out to be spot on. As I left the company building, Chloe hadn't left but was waiting at the entrance. The security guards had tried several times to make her leave, but she wouldn't budge. When she saw me, her eyes lit up. Dan, I need to talk to you. I raised my hand to stop the guards. She stood up straight, adjusting her disheveled clothes. It's been a while. Can we talk? Chapter 13. In a quiet tea house, Chloe personally poured tea and set it in front of me. Even though she had asked to talk, we sat in silence for a long time. I glanced at the tea in front of me. If you've got something to say, just say it. Chloe gave me a bitter look. I, I'm sorry. That's all she said. After all this time, this apology was a stark contrast to her arrogance five years ago. Seeing that I wasn't moved, Chloe's face turned red, then slowly went pale. Her voice weakened. I didn't get together with Alex. It was all a misunderstanding. I never meant to break up with you. A mocking smile tugged at the corner of my lips. As I smiled, her voice grew fainter. A tear fell, and Chloe quickly wiped it away. Is there really no chance for us anymore? I looked at her now fuller figure and the absence of the confidence she once had. I stayed silent. Chloe seemed to realize her appearance was not what it used to be. Her strong sense of pride shattered as she covered her face. I can't help it. I have to entertain. Drinking one round after another. Staying up late. The stress, it's impossible to keep my figure the same. She cried. Alex only used me to boost his fame with my connections and platform. When I gained weight, he started to resent me. But he never considered that without me. He's just a worthless, spoiled bum. So, after you left, you did get together with Alex, but you two didn't make it in the end. Hearing my words, Chloe stiffened. Now you're asking me if we can still be together. I'm wondering, are you really that clueless? I stood up. The only reason I even sat down with you for this half hour is out of respect for the 10 years we spent together. But if this is all you wanted to say, it's a complete waste of time. Chloe was stunned. Then what do you want to hear from me? Obviously. I want to talk about the shares I still have in United Media. Chloe's face fell. Seeing her expression, I couldn't help but laugh. Did you really think I'd come here to rekindle our old romance? This is the only thing we have left to discuss. Even though our artist contract is over, I still have my shares. Back when I was at the peak of my career, Chloe signed me with a promise that I would receive 20% of United Media's shares, and we signed a supplementary agreement. Of course, once I signed, she acted as if she had forgotten all about it. Four years. I never received any dividends. At the time, I didn't want to argue over money, so I stayed quiet. But now, it's time to get what's rightfully mine. Looking at her now, it's clear she intends to weasel out of this. So, I told Chloe to prepare to compensate me for all the unpaid dividends, or I would sue. Chapter 14 I had heard from Sandra that United Media hadn't been doing well in recent years, but I didn't expect it to be this bad. 
Less than half an hour after I left the tea room, I received a call from Sandra. Chloe's mother had contacted her, saying she wanted to have a word with me. Even bringing out her mother, someone who always disliked me and thought I was freeloading off her daughter. I was curious to see what this woman, who had looked down on me for years, had to say now. So, I dialed the number Sandra gave me using a virtual phone number. To my surprise, the first thing Chloe's mother said was, I agree to you and Chloe getting married. You won't need to pay any bride price. And let's not talk about the shares. You'll be family. So no need for two families to discuss business. I was speechless. When I didn't respond, she grew impatient. What? You still want the shares? Let me tell you, Daniel. Back in the day, many men lined up to marry my daughter. But she wasted her youth waiting for you. You're lucky she's not asking you for compensation for that. You're successful now. But you don't want to be caught in a scandal about abandoning her. Do you? Even after all these years, Chloe's mother hadn't changed a bit. I hung up the phone immediately. Then, I asked Sandra to help me file a lawsuit against Chloe. I sued her for the unpaid dividends stipulated in our contract, which amounted to over 50 million yuan. With this lawsuit, all the old drama between Chloe and me resurfaced. Chloe was furious. She released a doctored audio recording of our conversation in the tea room, distorting the facts and accusing me of abandoning her. She portrayed herself as a heartbroken woman who had waited for her boyfriend for five years. But the internet doesn't forget, before I even had a chance to respond. Sharp-eyed netizens dug up old news about her orchestrating a publicity stunt with Alex, showing off their trip to Santorini. Even photos of them staying in the same luxury hotel suite surfaced. Chloe's plan backfired completely. Chapter 15. After that, Chloe posted our contract with United Media, claiming I had broken it by signing with another company. She threatened to sue me for breach of contract. The amount she claimed in damages just so happened to be the same as the unpaid dividends, over 50 million yuan. Sandra countered with a trove of chat logs and recordings. It became clear that my contract had expired, and she had repeatedly tried to negotiate a renewal with United's higher-ups, only to be brushed off. This put United Media's management under fire in the trending searches. The real reason they didn't renew my contract back then was that they were watching Chloe's reaction. Now that Chloe's gamble had failed and she was no longer in control, the internal team had no interest in covering for her anymore. So, an insider came forward to explain. They revealed that the delay in renewing my contract was due to a massive argument I had with Chloe over Alex, which had embarrassed her. She had decided to teach me a lesson by purposely holding back my contract. With this revelation, Chloe's previous manipulative behavior was torn apart by angry netizens. Even Alex, who had long since parted ways with Chloe, was dragged into the mess. After leaving Chloe, Alex had ridden the wave of popularity she created for him, profiting handsomely from the website she built for him as a top author. Although he was plagued by plagiarism scandals, he still managed to rake in significant royalties, but his writing skills were mediocre at best. After splitting from Chloe, his subsequent books barely made any impact. So, once again, Alex couldn't resist plagiarizing someone else's work. This time, though, he messed with the wrong person. He copied an early work by a well-known author. That author collected the evidence and sued Alex, winning the case. Alex's reputation was utterly destroyed. The website cancelled his contract and demanded he return his royalties. Now, Alex was drowning in debt, completely overwhelmed. Dragged down by Chloe, he snapped and went on a rant on social media. Not only did he admit to the rumors about him and Chloe's pre-wedding fling in Santorini, but he also cursed Chloe. Daniel gave up everything for her, but she's just a shameless woman. The moment she saw me, her first love, she threw herself at me. I didn't even want to deal with her. But she insisted that she'd made it and could take me to the top. Come on. We're all men here, you tell me. Who would refuse when something like that is handed to you on a silver platter? I just made the same mistake any man would. Chloe is the real villain. Alex's meltdown only made the situation messier. Meanwhile, I hadn't said a word publicly. But my legal team had been working behind the scenes. Soon, the court ruled that Chloe had to pay me over 50 million yuan in dividends and interest. Chapter 16. After the court ruled against Chloe. She tried to contact me several times. She wanted to reminisce and use old feelings to smooth things over. But I refused to see her. Who would believe that a former girlfriend who hadn't tried to contact me in five years still had any genuine feelings? She simply saw my comeback and wanted to get me back under her control for her own gain. I'm not sure what Chloe had been up to all these years. To pay the 50 million yuan, she had to sell her house and some of her shares. Once the money was in my account, I immediately sold my shares in United Media to Chloe's major shareholder. By the time she found out, it was too late. She had completely lost her absolute control over United Media. In the end, United Media was renamed Fading Media and merged under the major shareholders' conglomerate. Chloe had spent over a decade building her empire, 
only to end up as a mere employee for someone else. Alex didn't fare any better. His shameful public rant attracted the attention of bored internet users, and some even dug up personal details about his current girlfriend, harassing her endlessly. The woman he had just started planning to marry broke up with him after all the harassment. Five years ago, he ruined my chance to get married right before the wedding. Five years later, he lost his own fiancé. After that, I stopped paying attention to either of them. Jana stayed in the country for a while before deciding to return to the US for further studies. On the day I saw her off, Jana said to me, Next time, can you be my leading man again? I nodded. Of course. Jana smiled mischievously. I mean, be the leading man in my life. I froze. But by then, she had already turned and walked through the security gate without looking back. It was as if those words had been a figment of my imagination. Of course, it wasn't until I was nearly 40 that I finally gained the approval of Jana's parents. But that's a story for another time.